church in our uh, Sunday morning sermon for uh, November the 21st. Uh, this is, uh, the text is from uh, Psalm 90, verses uh, 1 through 12. I want to read for you verses uh, 1 through 9. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night, which, by the way, is uh, quoted again later in First Peter. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but evening in it, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger, terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under wrath. <clears throat> we finish our years with a moan. In 1976, popular Christian author Francis Schaeffer published a landmark book documenting the decline of Western culture and how Christians should respond to it, entitled, How Should We Then Live? In this book, the late professor detailed the philosophical shift in Western thinking from traditional moral values based on the God-centered truths of Scripture to today's more contemporary, human-centered views of an ever-evolving man-made morality. As usual, the media has taken to its popular pulpit telling us that all reasonable folks have come around to adopt a more progressive way of thinking that requires they stand up for formerly immoral activities like homosexuality and abortion as though such behavior were suddenly moral. Schaefer's book documents the gradual replacement of biblical values with man-made morality that's based on the assumptions of a political ruling class rather than the timeless truths of scripture. By placing human morality above the morality of the Bible, Western culture, says Schaefer, began to sag, and the system of government set up by our forefathers, based on the enlightened pr biblical principles, naturally began to decline. Even our Constitution, which is obvious based on, obviously based on various biblical assumptions, suddenly doesn't make sense to people because our political values have changed so rapidly. Whether human laws agree with scripture doesn't really matter anymore to most people, and comparing the two has become political suicide because of the sacred, secular wall that's been raised between the church and state. And so the question is, how should we then live? How should you and I as believers live in this kind of thinking world? Should we go along to get along, in, uh, get along With, with what people believe to be right and wrong, or resist today's morality for the sake of traditional biblical thinking? Is today's conventional wisdom and the science that says it represents, uh, says, says science that says rep represents its truth, does it replace our parents' morality? Are morals like biblical truth timeless? Or is the Bible subject to the progressive evolution of human moral preference? The Old Testament Book of Psalms is a five-part collection of moral poems intended to guide biblical believers in the instruction of God's Word. Authors like David, who lived through his share of moral blunders and personal tragedies, share insights into the wisdom of their experience and the inspiration of divine revelation. I'd like to read just a portion of Psalm 90, a Hebrew poem that is actually attributed to Moses, and begins the fourth of the five books of the Psalms. This is a Psalm 90 verse 10. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. In other words, we'll live to be 70 or 80. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that it's that that is due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The stated purpose of Psalm 90 is to ask God to teach us 
uh, the heart of wisdom by numbering our days on earth. The Hebrew literally reads, make us to know the limits of our mor mor mortality so as to move us in the direction of, of wise moral convictions. So using the psalmist's prayer, I'd like to outline our passage addressing the question, how should we then live? First, in verse 12, the psalmist asks God to help number our days so that we're compelled to acknowledge the fact, fact that time passes quickly. And so no one is, is exempt from the consequences of life's end. In other words, ignoring the limits of time in your life, or in your life or mine, is completely and utterly foolish. Since God is eternal and humanity is obviously not, the way to understand the brevity of one's life and thus to gain a heart of wisdom, wisdom is to ask God for insight. Eugene Peterson's The Message Bible translates verse 10 to read, We live for 70 years or so, with luck we might make it to 80. And what do we have to show for it? Trouble. Toil and trouble and a marker in the graveyard. Our time on earth is of the essence, and each person is going to be held accountable for how they invest their allotted time. Which brings us to the second point based on the psalmist's question in verse 11. Who knows the power of God's anger? Sure, our God is a forgiven God of abundant grace, but forgiveness doesn't include unrepentant stupidity or deliberate denial of time-tested truth. Evidently, there's hell to pay for abusing one's time on earth, and some people can expect to pay a price for their t life's time spent. Therefore, a certain amount of mortal fear should remind us that we're all going to be held accountable for how we spend the time God has given us in this life. And then finally, the psalmist pointedly asked God in verse 12 to teach us how to number our days. Counting one's days with a reasonable sense of time's economy is the biblical way to gain a heart of wisdom. By numbering the value of each day, disciples can actually thrive in the midst of overwhelming spiritual and cultural despair and decadence. We just have to trust that God is telling us the truth in Scripture. In Mark chapter 8, we find Jesus is feeding some 4,000 people, then warning his disciples to beware of the, of the Pharisees and Herod. Later in verse 22, he heals a blind man and prompts Peter to proclaim him as the Son of God and Jewish Messiah. In verse 31 of Mark 8, Jesus solemnly predicts his upcoming death, and in verse 34, he calls the disciples closer to hear him say, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, he says in verse 35, will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Then after what must have been a moment of extended and uncomfortable silence, Jesus asks, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I'm not sure you'll find any more sober or serious words in all of Scripture. In Jesus' day, Condemned prisoners were made to carry their own execution crosses to the site of their crucifixion. In Jesus' mind, the suffering that awaited him on the cross at Calvary was what disciples should expect for themselves. You see, Jesus was essentially teaching that people who dare to call themselves disciples must be willing to be condemned by this world in order to follow him. The Good News Bible translates verse 10 poetically. Seventy years is all we have, eighty if we're strong. Yet all they bring us is trouble and sorrow. Life is soon over, and then we're gone. We don't usually associate characters like Abraham and Moses with sophisticated time management principles or human resource efficiency charts. And yet they're considered primary examples of faithful servants who wisely invested their lives in the work of doing God's will. These guys were shepherds by trade, who didn't believe that time spent with God, no matter how seemingly isolated or bizarre, was ever time wasted. 
As a matter of fact, they literally defined the biblical concept of faith in terms of giving God uncontested first place in their lives. Sure, they had their moments, we all do. But in the end, they saw beyond the personal limits of their time on earth into the timeless rewards of God's faith. Somehow Abraham and Moses found enough time in their lives to make sense of their conspicuously divine experiences based upon the broad prospects of God's eternity, and their stories still bless us today. Abraham was tested by offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, but he managed to see beyond, to see beyond his crisis of faith by trusting in God's plan, believing that Jehovah Jireh, God, would provide. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Moses was challenged to leave the safety of his desert home in Midian and lead the enslaved Israelites out of Egypt, a task of almost suicidal prospects. Yet Moses saw beyond the setbacks and painful political betrayals and maintained his faith in God to get the job done. What Moses saw was an eternity of promise rather than a short-term way to ease Israel's discomfort. In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, In Romans chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says, The righteous shall you live by faith. As with anyone who lives in this world, what we do with our lives is determined in large part by what we do with God's gift of time. Upon leaving his disciples to return to the Father in heaven, Jesus states in John 14, 26, The counselor whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything. That is, he will remind you of everything I have said to you. More valuable than a king's ransom is the gift that Christ invested into you and me when he left this earth and gave us his Holy Spirit. The righteous shall live by faith, but only if they utilize the presence of Christ in their hearts as the deciding factor in matters of truth and morality. Schaefer's question, how shall we then live, has an answer if we'll just see it through the wisdom of Scripture. And the answer is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and and time. During the American Revolution, <clears throat> a man named Colonel Rao was commander of British troops stationed in western New Jersey. One evening, when he had some of his officers, one evening when some of he and his officers were playing cards, a messenger rode into camp with an urgent communication from the battlefield. What this note said was that General George Washington had miraculously led a regiment of colonial revolutionaries across the, the Delaware River, an impossible feat, and was preparing for a fight. However, Rawl was too busy amusing himself playing cards to read the note, and he stuffed it into his vest pocket and returned to the game. By the time he got around to reading the message, Washington had accomplished the impossible task of crossing the Delaware and struck the ill-prepared British troops at, T at, at Trenton. In desperation, Rawl tried to rally his troops, but his thoughtless de delay turned out to be a huge mistake. Not only was Rawl's army defeated, he was killed in what turned out to be one of the most decisive battles in America's war for independence. Historian Nolbert Quayle writes, Only a few minutes' delay cost Rawl his life, his honor, and the liberty of his soldiers. Earth's history is strewn with the wrecks of half-finished plans and unexecuted resolutions. Tomorrow is the excuse of the lazy and the refuge of the incompetent. Psalm 66, verse 16 says, Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. Man's pride makes it difficult, if not impossible, to hear God's message and live by faith. Many deny the need to fear God, or, to, or they prefer to call it religion and leave it at that. However, verse 11 asks, Who knows the power of God's anger, for his wrath is as great as the fear that is due him? 
I suppose it's not religiously correct to think of God in terms of his righteous indignation or angry wrath, but judgment is as much a part of God's character as is our, our as our compassion <coughs> and grace. Puritan preacher Jonathan Edwards in his 1641 sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, described God's wrath as being like great waters dammed up, increasing more and more and rising higher and higher. And the longer the stream has stopped, the more rapid and mighty is the course when it's let loose. There's nothing but the mere pleasure of gold, the measure of God, that holds the waters back. The psalmist wasn't attempting to intimidate readers with the fear of fire and brimstone. He was simply acknowledging the other side of God's gracious character. Sure, God is willing to forgive repentant sinners, but he must do something with their sin other than pretend it never happened. Forgiven or not, sin must produce consequences if biblical principles are to be anything more than just religious ta taboos. We strive and we struggle to make good with our lives, but all is not good. And ignoring the existence of evil or denying that sin exists doesn't make it go away. The most important moment in life is that time when you and I decide that we're going to do something about the injustices within ourselves as well as those moral injustices around us. Some will choose to wrestle with life's problems philosophically and ask themselves, well then, how should I live from now on? Some will attempt to dismiss the uncomfortable presence of injustice with spiritual diversions asking themselves irrelevant questions of profound insignificance. But most of us will just ignore it. That is, until evil rears its ugly head in such a way that time on earth simply comes to a sudden and anguishing stop. There are two ways to humble the heart for sin, said another famous Puritan preacher, Jeremiah Burroughs, in the 1600s. There is looking upward unto God and saying, Whom it is you have sinned against, and looking downward to thine own misery. And what, you've and what you've deserved by sin. The psalmist was aware, and every believer should know, that God's wrath will not remain damned up forever. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 9, the apostle John sees a star falling from the sky, and he says that the star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When the abyss is open, smoke rises from it, like the smoke from a gigantic furnace, the sun and the sky are darkened by the smoke from the abyss. There's no heart of wisdom until the problem of sin is confronted and dealt with in more than just a moment's thought. In order for God to be truly righteous, sin has to be something more than merely disappear. Sin has to do something more than merely disappear. It must either consume the fool who succumbs to its logical consequences or re be replaced by an adequate means of compensation so that the sin and the sinner are no longer one and the same. <clears throat> Several years ago, in a Peanuts cartoon, as you see on the screen, the ever-thoughtful Charlie P Brown said to C Common Sense Lucy, someone has said that it, we should live each day as if it were the last day of our life. Suddenly, Lucy gets a panicked look on her face, and she screams, Ah! This is the last day? This is it? Then she dashes away, screaming, I only have 24 hours left. Help me! Help me! This is the last day of my life! Ah! In the last frame of the cartoon, Charlie Brown, now standing alone, says, Some philosophies aren't for all people. Verse 12 in the Good News Bible says, Teach us how short our life is so that we may become wise. The person who spins... <clears throat> their life planning for tomorrow can't help but leave today sadly incomplete. However the, however, the person who lives each day as God has given them can accomplish the task of living and being prepared to meet their maker. The Apostle James in chapter 4 verse 13 describes this life as a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. If we learn nothing else from scripture, it's that God's people have always lived day by day by faith in God. They didn't live by the vague prospects of what they thought might be right or wrong, but according to what they knew from Scripture to be God's absolute truth. Through their experiences, they passed along the tradition of hope that remains the gospel of today, that God will indeed save the repentant sinner. Today, as they say, is the first day of the rest of your life. You and I will be challenged and tested to see if our humanity has blocked our vision of eternity. 
The truth is, in contemporary American society, Christians who follow the scriptures are often considered knuckle-dragging Neanderthals, severely lacking in intelligence and embarrassingly unsophisticated. But if my living as a Christian means that my neighbors are going to think I'm part of some vast right-wing cons conspiracy, then let it be so. For I am what I am by God's grace, and not of my own doing. <clears throat> In a recent Christian Post article, <clears throat> Baptist Collegiate Ministries Director Josh Gilmore, <clears throat> Gilmore writes about the decline of what he calls popular Christianity along with some of its more notable character, uh, celebrities. Names like Carl Lenz of Hillsong Church in New York, Ravi Zacharias of RZM Ministries, Bill Gothard of the Institute of Basic Life Principles, singer Jennifer Knapp, and a host of other celebrity Christians who've succumbed to the ugly truth of undeniable scandals that rock the Christian world. Somewhere New York Times best-selling authors, writes Gilmore, some filled arenas with their popular Christian music, some were pastors whose sermons were broadcast, broadcast around the globe. Some even served in Christian higher education. Today their names are no longer mentioned among Christians except when expressed as a historically, historical cautionary tale. In Luke 6, Jesus warns his disciples about allowing their reputations to become the source of scandalous egos. He says, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. In the article, Gilmore goes back on his own, looks back on his own upbringing in a small but morally respectable church where its biblical teaching wasn't necessarily smiled on, but it represented God's timeless truth. As Christians, we must stand for something, otherwise we'll fall for everything. Let us stand strong for the teachings of our Savior in Scripture, who literally suffered and died on the cross for the sins of other, others while he himself had no sin. The philosophical shift in Western thinking has certainly been dramatic in the last few decades. As cultural sophisticates continue to preach their message of evolving morality on topics ranging from homosexuality to abortion, Christians are called upon to cling to the timeless truth of Scripture rather than give in to the popular moral trends of today. So to answer the question of how should we should then live, let me say that we should live as believers have always lived, numbering the days of our lives in order that we may gain a heart of wisdom. May God bless you, and God bless Calvary Baptist Church.